you've been with us the past few Sundays, we've been going through the book of Galatians, but this morning we're going to take a different turn, and we're going to touch on a different text, and prayfully trust that God's going to speak to us through it. And the inspiration really for the text this morning is a song that we actually just sang, and that is, O taste and see that the Lord is good. And that psalm is actually found in the 34th chapter of the book of Psalms in your Bible, and I would encourage you to turn there with me as we explore it. And so what we just sang was not originally written by a modern worship team. It was something that was written thousands of years ago by a man of worship, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he begins in verse 1 to 3 by stating something quite amazing. He says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord, not on Sunday morning, not three times a week. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, not spontaneously, not sporadically, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast. Now, a lot of people boast. They boast in their strength. They boast in their knowledge. They boast in their resources. They boast in their network. But this man says, my soul will only boast in one thing, and that is in the Lord. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. See, a proud person can't understand this concept of boasting in the Lord. Because proud people boast in themselves. Proud people don't consider how God is the one who has influenced every idea, every fabric of your existence is provided and empowered by God. And so this psalmist knew something that only the humble will really hear what I have to say in this psalm. Let the humble hear and be glad. And you stop there and you think that this is some journal entry that David wrote And was somehow given to us by God and we're thankful for it. But this is not a personal journal entry. David had in mind for readers to read it and for an audience to hear it. And to join him in this lifelong devotion to blessing, praising, and boasting God for the rest of his days. Look at verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name Together, this psalm is an invitation to join David in what he promised that he would do in the first two verses. But what's amazing here is that David did not just have a general audience in mind. The Holy Spirit has given us the word of God for all time, all cultures, forever. That is true. But there's a context here. David had an immediate audience when he wrote this. David had somebody before him when he wrote this. And You see it in this little paragraph right before verse 1. It tells us, it gives us a description of the psalm. It says, it's a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Now that does not mean anything to us if we don't understand where this is coming from. This psalm was written at a specific time in David's life and we're thankful to God that it is recorded in detail of what this whole scenario is about. David, he wasn't just a songwriter. If you're familiar with your Bible, or if you're even familiar with biblical characters, you know that David was a king. He was the king of Israel. He was the most cherished king, the most memorable king. But David wasn't a king all his life. Before David was a king, he was a shepherd boy. He would worship the Lord in the fields when no one was looking. He was taking care of sheep day in and day out. And it was God who saw something special in David's heart To pull him out from being a shepherd in a field and making him a shepherd of a nation. But between that moment of being a teenager boy in a farm and him being the king of a palace and of an entire nation was a transitional period. And David wrote this song not when he was a king, but probably in one of the most troubling seasons of his life. Which tells me something about David. David didn't worship God only when he felt like it. David didn't worship God only when things were going right. David knew how to seek God and declare the goodness of God 
when times were very dark. And this is one of those psalms. Here's the story. Before David was a king, there was another king named King Saul. And King Saul recruited David to be a soldier in his army because he was a mighty man. He slew Goliath, as we know. He took care of Philistines like they were nothing. He was a one-man army. And this man, for some reason, provoked the king to be jealous of him. And this jealousy so corrupted the king that he began to now shift his focus from taking care of a kingdom and is now obsessed with the concept of taking out David, the man that he loved at first and brought him in in the first place. Now what makes this even worse is that King Saul was not just David's boss. King Saul was David's father-in-law. And you know, when we get hurt by people, it's one thing to be hurt by a stranger or by our boss or by whoever, but when it's somebody close, that's when it stings the most. And David is so concerned about the welfare of his life that what does he do? He has to leave home. He has to leave the palace. He has to leave his familiarity. And now he is wandering alone, trying to figure out where to go next. With these conflicting thoughts that he knew he was going to be king, that God had blessed him and brought him to this place, and now everything seems to be coming to shambles, seems to be crumbling. And so David, who is operating in so much fear at this point, comes to a certain extent in which he tries to seek refuge in the enemy's camp. He goes to a place called Gath in 1 Samuel 21. And for some reason, he, he thinks, okay, well, if I can't go home, if my own hometown, if my own kingdom wants to kill me, where else am I going to go? So he goes to the Philistines. And when he gets to the Philistines, they realize and recognize who he is. And they begin to talk about him. And David becomes so afraid that he pretends to be insane as a method. He, he pretends to be insane. So what does he do? He, he begins to scratch at the gates and he begins to make marks on the wall and he lets spit come down his beard and he, he begins to move around like a maniac. And the king of the Philistines is going, I have enough madmen in my army. We don't need another one. Get rid of this guy. And he flees from that place. And then in 1 Samuel 22, David now finds himself in a cave. In a cave. And as he's in a cave, his family hears about it. And they come to comfort him. And not just his family, but I'm going to read this to you now. In 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2, we see another audience that joins David in that cave. It says, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, listen to the description of the crowd that came. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over them and there with them about 400 men. And this is where it is believed where David wrote this psalm and this is who it is believed that David originally wrote Psalms 34 to. A bunch of men, 400 of them, that also left the kingdom of Saul, that were distressed in spirit, that were bitter, that were in debt, that were weighed down by life. Do you think the Holy Spirit had just these group of 400 men in mind when he penned this psalm through David? No, he has the same audience in mind today. Men and women who are embittered, who live under a dark cloud, who are questioning the oppression that they are experiencing almost on a daily basis, who have no answers, who don't know where to go next. This is the audience for this psalm. It was in David's day, and it's the same in 2019. And David, imagine now, in this cave with these 400 men, says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let's do it together, guys. And that invitation is the same for us. But David doesn't just stop there. We have a bunch of verses that follow that. Because what David is about to do now is give reasons to his readers and to his hearers by the Holy Spirit to why we should come into that state of mind. To why we should join him in that lifelong devotion of loving God and praising God. And I want to pull four points out of this entire psalm. You can preach a sermon from one verse out of this psalm. But for the sake of overview and for the sake of getting the, the gist of it, let's look at four main points. And to summarize it. This whole psalm really is about one thing. 
it boils down to the blessings that are experienced by God solely for those who are rightly related to him. What David's about to do now is declare blessing after blessing after blessing. But it is not for the world. People have a misconception that just because we're created by God, we are all deemed as children of God. That is not true according to the Bible. It might be true for the most popular teacher on TV, but it might not be true for this. It is saying here for a specific audience, are these blessings reserved for? And this is what the Bible is trying to do, provoke us to step into that relationship with God in order to be showered with these blessings. So what blessings are there? Well, we see from verse 4 down to verse 7. Let's read. I sought the Lord. Oh, we just sang it. And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The first batch of blessings that are reserved for the righteous is protection. Protection. He says here in verse 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me. One thing that we need to know about God is this, is that he is seekable. That God can be sought. That if we were to give our faith, our attention, our time, our energy to gaze upon the Lord, he can be engaged and he can hear our specific cries, our worries, our needs, and answer them very specifically. I'm talking about answers to prayer that are beyond coincidence, that have a divine imprint upon it. This is the reality of the God of the Bible. And he says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. And, and David says this in light of what we just heard about the context. When did he pray? If you read 1 Samuel 21 and 22, all I see is a righteous man who is called to be a king, not very acting, very kingly. He's scratching at a wall and he's saliving down his beard and you think, okay, by the way, just because it's recorded in the Bible doesn't mean we repeat the behavior. It's a narrative. Just because David didn't mean that we can do that in certain situations. That's not what it's saying. But I'm reading this and I go, he's testifying in a cave about how he was delivered from the enemy's camp when in his own fear he brought himself to that place. When did he seek the Lord? Did he go into a certain place and see God on his knees and figure out an idea? Let me just act insane. There is no evidence of that. The only way we can re re really reconcile this is, is that although he acted in the flesh, and although he acted in fear, there was an inward cry that he brought before God. And though it was feeble and small and of a mustard size type of faith, God heard him. God heard him, even in that pathetic type of state. Even in the midst of that fear, there was a, a brim of light of faith. And that was enough for God to deliver him out of that situation. David recognized that it wasn't based on his own wisdom that he got himself. It wasn't his cleverness. He sought God at one point in that moment, which makes this even more glorious that I don't even have to voice my prayer. God knows my thoughts. God knows my fears. And if I direct it towards him, that's all it takes for him to come in and step and intervene. But he had a specific fear in mind. And we read that in 1 Samuel 21. Verse 12, he says, And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So when he heard that the king and the soldiers were inquiring of him, he didn't know what was going to come about it when he was in the enemy's camp. Are they going to kill me? Are they going to take me out? Are they going to recruit me and use me? I don't know. And he was much afraid. And he operated in a strange way out of that fear. Because the reality is, is that fear is a powerful thing. Fear is so powerful. Fear paralyzes people from moving forward in life. Fear cripples people from answering the call of God and to walk in righteousness and to walk obediently to his word in an antichrist culture. Fear plants lies. Fear makes you believe things to be true when they're not really true. Fear can suffocate you with anxiety to such an intensity in which you lose sleep at night and you can't even stay focused throughout the day. Fear also can produce things, not just take things from you. 
Fear can make you like David, act in a way that you never thought you would act. Lie about things that you would never lie about. Be deceitful about things that you never thought you would hide. But no matter how powerful fear may be as a force, God is more powerful than our fears. And that's what we see here in David's life. That he knew that God was able to save him, not just from some of his fears, but all of his fears. He says, I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all my fears. Now, God can deliver you and I from our fears in at least two ways. God can remove the object of fear from my presence so that I'm relieved from the very thing that I'm afraid of. But he does something even better than that. A deeper supernatural work. He doesn't just want to remove the fear from our presence so that we're not afraid of it anymore. He wants to remove the fear from within us. So that whether that thing is in our presence or not, we will not be shaken or moved. That's how God deals with the human heart. When we yield to him and surrender to him and trust who he is. And that's what we see here. That this fear in the soul was slashed by the truth of God's word. Because look at verse 7. He was operating under a revelation. It says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Isn't that amazing? That the way to overcome fear of everything else is to fear God. The way for me to overcome fear, according to this verse, is to direct my fear towards God. And you think, afraid of God? No. The fear of the Lord is another way of saying a reverential awe. An inward trembling of the realization of the majesty, the holiness, the righteousness, the omnipotence of God. It's not a, I'm afraid of God. It's God is so awesome and it penetrates you to a way in which you behave in a certain way and you operate in a certain state of mind. You realize his authority. You realize his kingship. You realize that he's the author of all creation and you realize that this God wants to know you personally. And it causes you to fear. And he says that the angel of the Lord, which is another, another title for the person of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Don't get caught up with angel in the picture that it's a, it's a creature with beings. The word angel is actually the word messenger. The messenger of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. And it says in camps. It doesn't say once in a while part-time. He doesn't share the blessing of protection and spread it bit by bit to different children. No, he encamps. It's as though it says he pitches his tent exactly where you are, no matter where you are, at any time, 24-7 surveillance. That's what's granted to you and me. That in this world of senses, there is an unseen realm and there is an unseen God who ensures us that no matter what is before me, no matter what's beside me, and though I don't know what's behind me, I know this, that I'm already surrounded by a loving, all-powerful being, and he's my God. And so he walked with that, that though he was in the field, or though he was in the cave, or though he was in the camp of Gath, he knew that God was with him throughout it all. And he operated under that revelation. And he soothed his soul with that truth. And that's why I look at verse 5. It says, those who look to him are radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. What he's trying to say there, as long as the eyes of your heart are continually gazing, always meditating upon the truth of God being with you and for you, it will actually affect the way you look to a certain extent. You know, many people don't have to say things. You can just look at their face. You can look at the windows of their soul, these eyes, and they can tell you a lot. But the faces of the righteous, there's a brimming joy. There's a confidence. Not a boasting in self, but a boasting in God that is visible by the outside world. And it's even more visible when you and I are in circumstances that demand panic, but we are still because we know that he is God. David says, Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Why? Because there is protection when you fear him. Can you imagine that in that cave? You see these distressed soldiers. You see these hunchback men that are tired and weary from being beaten and battered by life. And he's saying, listen, realize that no matter if Saul is after you, it doesn't matter. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. He's preaching to them. He's counseling them. 
But then he now is so bubbling up with joy. He is so exploding with revelation that it burst out in verse 8 with a simple word, oh. He goes, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He can't even contain it. You can see something in David that he is so enjoying his relationship with God that he wants other people to come and enjoy it with him. He goes, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. He just burst out in song. He burst out in praise. And what I love about what David is doing here in the Holy Spirit is that he is using experiential language to describe his relationship with God. He doesn't say, oh, study and memorize that the Lord is good. He didn't say, oh, do quizzes and tests and realize that God is good. No, he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He parallels the physical senses and he translates it into a possibility in which you and I can know God in a tangible way. Not through these senses though, but through something even more real. And that's the spiritual sense. He's appealing to experience. He's, he's appealing to knowledge that is feelable to a certain extent. Because hear me very carefully. There are a lot of things that can be explained concerning who God is and what his word says. That's true. We are called to teach we are called to study, we are called to proclaim, we are called to use reason and logic and declare it to the masses to come to the knowledge of truth. We are actually saved by a knowledge and understanding of a certain truth. But there are certain things about God that cannot really be explained but are more so called to be experienced. And David has reached the ceiling. David has come to a place where it went beyond the quarters of the mind and went beyond stuffing information in my head. He went to a realm of experience and he's inviting us to do the same. He's saying, you, listen, you got to experience him. You yourself have to come to a place in which you can testify that you've tasted and seen that God is good. And let me tell you something. You know somebody who's tasted and seen that God is good. I can tell the difference between somebody who studied God and somebody who sat with God. And known God. And experienced God. There's a big difference here. But what the, the glorious truth is, is that the Bible is inviting all of us to come into that place. In which it, it affects the deepest faculties of our being. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we wonder, okay, well how do I get there? Do I got to separate myself into some wilderness, into some church or some place in which I become a monk for a certain amount of years? Absolutely not. In fact, those who taste and see that the Lord is good are probably one of the most effective Christians in society. Because what they have is contagious. And when they've tasted and seen, they don't keep it to themselves. Like David, they go out and invite others to join into the quest. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How do I get there? I'll tell you how you get there. He says, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The avenue to going into the place where I know God in an experiential way. The gateway for me to come from this hollow understanding of God into a real rich relationship with Him is when we take refuge. And this is just simply a poetic way of saying putting your trust in Him. Surrendering your heart completely to Him. Taking your faith, your trust, and saying, I give it all to you, God. My future, my eternal destination, my day-to-day, -day, my life, my gifts, my resources, I give it all to you. Once you come to that place, you've opened yourself up to the possibilities of knowing God in a way that will rock your world. And then he says here, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Because those who fear him have no lack. They have no lack. In other words, the second blessing here, we talked about protection. And from verse 8 to verse 10, we're talking about satisfaction. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Why? Because there is, 
There's protection, but let me tell you something else. There's a satisfaction in God that when you choose to trust in him, you will realize something supernatural happens in your soul. And what happens is you begin to find yourself not wanting. I believe what David had in mind here was beyond physical provision. Because here's the reality. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. In my context, if I were to measure up the misery in people's lives, I found that the most miserable people are in fact the richest. The one who have the most. The most food in their fridge, the most money in their bank, the most cars in their driveway. You'd be amazed to know how many people are scratching their heads and going even beyond banging their heads against the wall trying to figure out how the American dream actually was a nightmare. I can tell you people from 19 years of age to 59 years of age who can testify that they have given their work finger to the bone and they've come to a place in which they found that they're still lacking something within, that they're still wanting. And yet this same David in Psalms 23 said, the Lord is my shepherd, what? I shall not want. When I've come into this right relationship with God, I've realized something about my inner man, it's full. I'm full. I'm not wandering in this world anymore. I'm not trying to stuff myself with something to fill in that void. I've come to a place of settled contentment. And I am testifying that it is true. And he even points to the lions. He goes, the young lions suffer want and hunger. So the lion, which is symbolic of, as we know, the king of the jungle, right? Probably one of the most feared animals. Such agility, strength, status, reputation. Yet even lions suffer want and hunger. And you as an individual can be a type of lion in our society. You can be praised for your strength. You can be recognized for your status and reputation in the kingdom. You can be even feared your presence can make people intimidated. Your presence can make people respected. But I can tell you that even people like that suffer want and hunger. The young lions suffer want and hunger. But here's the promise. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I can tell you the richest person in the world, it is the individual who knows how to seek God guaranteed satisfaction and David is so convinced of this that he doesn't even wait to the end of the psalm to make his invitation for people to come into this place he comes to verse 11 he goes come oh children listen to me come oh children listen to me well, hold on children I thought you were in a cave with 400 grown men how dare you identify them as children Because David is doing something here, the same thing that Jesus did, is that he calls upon us to be like children, not childish, but to be like children in recognizing our need for guidance and wisdom to be navigated through life. Recognizing that I am dependent upon a greater source, a greater mind, a greater power. Recognizing that I don't have all the answers and I haven't figured it all out in life. And he identifies them as children and he provokes them to respond as children lest they cut themselves off from receiving what God wants to give them. Come, O children, listen to me. And then he says, I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. And he stops. I mean, I wish I could have heard this live. He stops and he goes, what man, verse 12, is there that desires life? Like, do you want to live? Do you want to live? Now, there are some people that don't want to live. And it's a scary place to be in life. Do you want to live? Who loves many days that he may see good? This is for you. And whatever version of life you've created for yourself that may seem good, David is so confident in the Holy Spirit to say, it's nothing in comparison to what God has when you say yes to him. 
And he says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. If we can bundle that up in one statement, what, Paul, what uh, David's trying to say is, walk in the path of holiness. Walk in the path of holiness through Christ. But hold on tight. This is not something concerning our behavior. There's a greater thing that needs to be done for us to get there. He talks about satisfaction. Then he comes to the third point here. He says in verse 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I got to read that again. Because I just finished and I was really close of saying yes. When I heard all this stuff about protection and satisfaction. You're telling me that the angel of the Lord will encamp around me and deliver me? You're telling me that my soul will know something of a satisfaction that is settled for all the days of my life? This sounds really good. This Christianity stuff sounds really, really impressive. But now I come, David, and you you had me up to this point in your sermon because I'm reading something and I'm kind of concerned. I see something that says here that the righteous, like you're telling me, you're calling me to be righteous, but you're saying that the righteous will cry for help? And you're telling me that I'm going to have troubles? And you're telling me that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and crushed in spirit? Hold up. Okay, I, I was a little concerned. Now you've taken it over the top because you didn't say some. You didn't say a little. You said many are the afflictions of the righteous. Can you please help me reconcile how you just said that I will be satisfied and not wanting and yet you're telling me that there will be times where I'm going to cry for help. There are going to be times that I'm broken hearted. There are going to be times that I'm crushed in spirit and you're telling me that there's many afflictions? Please explain. Well, here's the explanation. That to believe for one to be rightly related to God shields one from the pains of this broken world is completely false. If you're shocked up to this point, let the shock factor increase. I'll tell you this, that in fact, if you come into relationship with Christ, you will have more affliction than you did before you decided to do so. Because you are literally walking against the current of our culture on a day-to-day. You are a fish swimming upstream. You are walking on a narrow path when everybody else is walking on a broad path. And what's happening while you're walking on a narrow path? You're being mocked and scolded and persecuted along the way. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And I think about David here, even in his context. David experienced deliverance from the king of Gath. Right? He acted like a maniac, which isn't the best thing to do in a situation. But somewhere in there, he prayed to the Lord. God delivered him. And yet he still says many are the afflictions. You know why he's saying many are the afflictions of the righteous? This is why. Because even though he escaped the king of Gath, there was still another king after him. King Saul. King Saul was still chasing him. King Saul was still after him. The reason why he was in the cave even after that is because he knows that there is another king after me. You want to talk about David's life? He had a problem and not just one problem. He had a problem upon problem upon problem. He had a layer of problems. So when one was dealt with, he still had many more to face. But though even he he did not see deliverance from all his issues, he was still confident enough in his relationship with God to say, it's not going to last. In fact, you can focus on the crushed in spirit. You can focus on the deliverance. You can focus on all these things. But look at the verses again and see the emphasis. The righteous cry for help. Here it is. The Lord hears. Delivers them out of all their troubles. He is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But what? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. So we do not live in this fairy tale mindset that it gets easier when we follow Christ. We are realistic. But David knew that even with my problems in life, I have something that the wicked doesn't have. 
I have something in this life, and that is my problem, sure, but in those problems, I have something of God's presence, and I will know something of God's power that I would not have known of otherwise. And therefore, I can face these issues with total confidence because the angel of the Lord encamps around me. And if anything is going to afflict me, I know that God's wisdom has been operated in that, letting these things touch me to a certain degree, but knowing that it is ultimately for my good. And knowing that it's ultimately for my deliverance. And knowing that it is ultimately to testify about the goodness of God. Jesus says something very plain and simple at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew 7, 24, after he teaches this sermon, he gives a final word to his audience. Just like David had an audience. He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So he gives a first illustration. When somebody hears what this word has to say and responds with obedience and surrender, it's like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. But then he goes on to say something else. And then the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. Okay, so if I build my house upon the rock, which is Jesus, if I build my life upon him, his wisdom, his revelation, his truth, it doesn't exclude me from the rain. It doesn't exclude me from floods or winds or any beating upon my life. The only difference is when these things come to me, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. But then there's another individual that Jesus has in mind. And he gives a warning before he closes his sermon. He says in verse 26, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. So even in a setting like this this morning, we're in a house. We're all sitting here. We chose to be here today. There's going to be two types of responses. There are going to be those who hear this and say, I'm going to choose to build my life upon what Jesus said in his word. Let me tell you something. If you choose to do that, rain is coming. Floods are coming. The wind is coming. Beating is coming to your house. But I promise you, according to the authority of this word, you won't fall. Yet there is another group of people who will not hear this. They'll hear it, but it's, it's going in and here, and they could care less. Let me tell you something in confidence. Rain is coming. Floods are coming. Wind is coming. A beating to your life is coming. But what happens? This is the difference. It does not do them. The rain fell, the winds flood, the floods came, the winds blew, and the beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The difference between the believer and the non-believer is this. Not that problems go when you're a believer, that prosperity comes in, health is perfectly intact. It's that despite these things, and though sometimes the wind might be knocked out of you, and sometimes you might fall, the only place where you're going to fall is on your knees. And you're going to realize that because you've made him your refuge, you will ultimately stand and you will see the end of the day and testify again of the faithfulness of God. Amen. Yet the others will be crushed by what will not crush you. I love that verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, what? He is a new creation. Behold, the old things have passed away and the new has come. But I like it in the New King James and the King James. Because it says, behold, the old things have passed away, and behold, all things have been made new. And somebody made this comment, and it was interesting. Paul says, all things become new. When you come into Christ, and anyone can come into Christ, all things become new. Hold on for a second. I know many Christians, including myself, that when I came into the faith, all things didn't become new. I still had the same clothes in my closet. I still had the same job at the time when I was 20. I was still going to the same school. I still had my family problems. I still had my own issues. I still had my own enemies. I still lived in the same house. I still took the bus. How did all things become new, as Paul says? Because many things are the same on the surface level. But what happens is, you and I become a new creation. You and I are supernaturally transformed. And I love what happens when a person becomes a believer. God doesn't just come into your heart, clean it up a little bit. He doesn't just patch it up. He literally takes it out and puts in you a new one. And he makes you a new person. 
and you become new, though everything around you is the same, but how all things become new is that you have a new perspective. You now see everything as though it was new. All the issues at home, all the issues in your personal life, all the issues that you faced before, all the limitations and all the opportunities and even the good things, everything is now filtered with a new set of eyes because of your relationship with Christ. That's how all things become new. Your outlook has changed because your inlook has been dealt with by God. And so you can look at these things in life and you can see them with a new commentary upon them. The Lord will deliver me. The Lord is with me. The Lord allowed this in his wisdom. I'm in the palm of his hand. I don't know how people live without God. He says, protection, satisfaction, and we just dealt with preservation. But what he's about to do now is save the last blessing as the best blessing. And he comes down to verse 20 to 22. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. That's a prophecy of Christ. Affliction will slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be condemned. And here it is in verse 22. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None who take refuge in him will be condemned. Protection. I praise God for that. Satisfaction. Thank the Lord. Preservation, what a wonderful thought. I can sleep at night knowing that my days are controlled by him. But here's the best for the last. It's not just protection. It's not just satisfaction. It's not just preservation. What David says in the Holy Spirit as the last blessing deals with one thing, and that is salvation. See, because what good is it to have protection, to have satisfaction, to have preservation in this life that's a breath, 70, 80 years, if you even get that. Only to slip into another world that is eternal, that is timeless, that is forever, that is sealed concerning my fate. What good if I have those things, that if I'm going to a place afterwards that doesn't include any of those things to the closest measure? What good is it? And that's why he mentions this. This final blessing doesn't deal with this life as much as it does in the next. What he says here is that the righteous will ultimately not be condemned. It deals with the legal position that every human being has before God. And this is the gospel. And this is the message of the Christian faith that makes it unique from all other faiths. Every world religion will recognize that there is a God with an objective moral standard. And every world religion will acknowledge that man has failed to keep the commands of God and are indebted to him and one day will be judged by him. We all stand condemned. We all stand condemned. And the solution to escaping that state of condemnation it's not that we try to impress God with our behavior. It's not that we try to persuade God with our devotion. It's not that we try to pull on him to a way in which we convince him after a lifelong of convincing that when we stand before him that he will wink at our sin and let us come in. That's not how it works. That's how it might work for Islam. That's not how it works for different world religions and different cults. But where we stand according to this word is that because of our failure to keep the commands of God, God in his holiness has every right to eradicate us and eliminate us for all eternity. Now that might make you feel uncomfortable, but when you govern your own universe, you can make your own rules. God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's a just God. He loves righteousness. He loves justice. And when sin is committed, it must be paid for. But the holiness of God is not just one of his attributes. It's not his complete character. It's one of his attributes because he's also love. And David knew something about the love of God. David lived in the Old Testament before Jesus Christ came on the scene. But David was not just a king, nor was he just a songwriter. David was a prophet. 
David was a prophet, meaning he had a special relationship with God in which he received revelation from heaven and given it as inspired scripture for all ages. And David knew something of a day that was to come, a day that was to come where God would come in the flesh and that he would live a life as a human being, fully God, fully man, representing the human race. And in that life, he never sinned. He never committed one sin, even in his thoughts or his mouth. And then he comes to a place in which in his mid-30s, early 30s, he's nailed upon a cross, and people generally know what this is about. They know that this Jesus figure died on the cross, but they don't understand the legal implications of that. The legal implications is this, is that though we all stand condemned, he being the perfect and righteous one who did not deserve condemnation, received condemnation. He stood in your place. I'm telling you this morning. He stood in your place, and he had you in mind 2,000 years ago. He had me in mind 2,000 years ago, and he, he was nailed on a cross, not because Roman soldiers determined it, not because religious Jews planned it, but because God preordained it through these vessels to put him in that place and ultimately make a payment. For anyone that would realize again, that would be humble enough, that would come like a child, that would come like a child and say to themselves, I'm in need. I'm in need. I realize that I can't be good enough for God. I realize that I can't impress him enough. I have good days, but even in my good days compared to his standard, they are bad days. Are you telling me that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me so that I would not be condemned? Oh, yes. And let me take it further than that. The righteous, as it says here. The children of God. The saints of the land are not righteous, nor are they children of God, nor are they saints, based on how they live their lives. That is something that has been given to them by the free gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ. You've been granted that status because of what Christ did on your behalf. He transfers his righteousness and his perfection to you so that when God sees your life, he sees perfection. He sees holiness. He, he sees you as though you have never sinned once. As though you've never broken his law even one time. But you might be thinking, I messed up a lot. And I still mess up a lot. Yeah, but what I'm telling you is this. The good news of the Christian faith is that no matter how much you've messed up, when you recognize that you did mess up, and when you realize that your mess up put him on the cross, and you realize that his love in the midst of your mess up is real, and you surrender to it, it's all wiped away, and it's all cleansed. You say, this is too good to be true. Well, welcome. That's why we call it the good news. That's why people come here, instead of sleeping in, to sing to God. Because we realize how good this news is. So never mind the other blessings if you've not even entered into the first one. In fact, let me put it this way. You cannot enter into those other blessings until you've entered into this one. Salvation. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. What's that refuge? Well, I'll tell you this. It's not a physical place where you hide yourself. It's not a philosophy that you entertain. It's not a state of mind that you achieve. That refuge is a person. And Paul said it clearly in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. David said it this way, none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And Paul has the same concept with different wording. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When I got saved, when I first got saved, I'll tell you that one of the most troubling things of my understanding of God is how he could really forgive me. Really. Because I'll tell you what it was like for my life. It wasn't that I was totally absent-minded to the truths of God's word. I grew up in the church my whole life, but I used the word of God and manipulated it in my own conscience so that I can perform my own deeds of wickedness, so I can live my own way of life and use the grace of God as a license to cover my sin and live independently from him. 
So then I would go to the parties and I would tell people who I was as a Christian and even defend the faith while intoxicated. And I would live the way I wanted to live while naming the name of Christ. I don't know about you, but I'd rather live in ignorance and live in sin than live with the knowledge of truth and still live in sin despite it. Who do you think is going to receive the greater condemnation? Class A hypocrite. And I will tell you this, and I don't boast in it. So hypocritical and so good at it that if you were to talk to me, you'd be convinced that I was a Christian. Oh, I knew what verses to whip up. And I knew the lingo. And I knew some of the songs. But down deep inside was a darkness. There was an inward corruption. There was no love of God in my heart. There was no realization of the price that he paid for me. There was no I surrender all. Barely I surrender some. And yet, I was a young lion. 20 years old, pumping my way through college, thinking that I ruled the place. I knew the people. I had the resources. It was all there. But I suffered want. I suffered want deeply. And that want drove me to something that God offered me that nothing else could offer me. Success couldn't offer me. Relationships couldn't offer me. Status could not offer me. It was there. I touched it. I tasted of it at a very young age. But it left me thirstier and thirstier the more I explored it. But when I came to him, he fulfilled and satisfied something in me that has still kept me full these past eight years. I'm still full. I'm not expecting to get hungry anytime soon. And I came to that place, but it was so hard because I was tasting and seeing that the Lord was good through circumstances. I was tasting and seeing that as I was setting my heart to him, he was revealing himself and giving me samples of what it's like to live for him and showing me people that were completely surrendered to him. It was so attractive to me. But how could God forgive me? I've used his name from all my high school years and all my college years up to a certain point, halfway through, and called myself something when I lived in total contradiction. If God is real, then I deserve to be judged. If God is real and if he's going to offer any type of forgiveness, maybe he'll just put me on the shelf. Or maybe he'll put me in some neutral place when I, when I die. He said, I won't throw you into hell, but I'll keep you there because you were sorry for your hypocrisy. But that's not what God did for me, nor does he do it for anybody. He not only forgives, he adopts. And he makes you a son and he makes you a daughter. And you think to yourself, well, I've been a hypocrite. It doesn't matter what sin it is. And then he goes even further than that because he gives you eternal life, but now he gives you life here. And then he gives you a purpose and it gives you a plan that you never thought you can orchestrate for yourself. And now you've come to a place where you've realized this is life. And life abundantly. And I took this verse for the first few weeks because I had so much trouble understanding forgiveness. I would write it, I wrote it on a post note and I put it above my laptop in my room. And I would just stare at it and any time I would just try to read it and let it be ingrained in my mind. Just like what David did. Slashing every lie in my soul with truth. Until it went from something here to something here. I tasted and I've seen this realization. And now I walk free from condemnation. I can tell you that with total confidence. Oh, don't you mess up? Yeah. Do I plan on it? No, but I, we all slip. But I don't slip into condemnation. I'm a son of God. You're a son of God if you're in Christ. You're a daughter of God. And what, what happens in that place is that I run to him and he forgives me. And I never now come to the place where I did before where I attempt to use that concept of God's forgiveness as a means to live selfishly. It's my ammunition. It's my fuel to live in holiness. So I don't run from sin because I want to try to get God's smile. I already have God's smile, so I'm going to run from sin. And so I join with David this morning in your presence. And I say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. 
And the only way you can't really exalt his name and the only reason why you can't magnify God is because you haven't experienced the blessings that I just gave. You don't know something about God's protection. You don't know the satisfaction that David mentioned. You don't know this concept and this promise of preservation. But it comes through the last blessing I mentioned, that's salvation. And it's available for you today. And then for the rest of your life, I can guarantee you, you will know something of this. And you will, in turn, not just respond to the invitation, but you yourself will make the invitation to others around you. Hey, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Do you want it? Because there's going to be two responses to this. One who will hear these words and build their house upon the rock. Or one who will hear these words and say, I'm still doing it my way how do you get there very simple you respond to the message of salvation which you recognize your need for forgiveness you realize your sin put him on the cross and you realize that your sin is no longer what you want to live for but you want to surrender to christ you understand that no good work will ever get you to heaven but what christ did on your behalf and you accept it by faith you say yes i believe jesus died on the cross and yes i know that apart from him i have no salvation and once you respond to that christ accredits that and makes it your standing of righteousness and this is something that is not limited to any person. All can respond. And when you truly respond that truth in your heart, something supernatural will happen to you. You will know God. And you will live the rest of your life knowing, praising, serving God, not out of compulsion, but because your heart has been made new and you are longing to walk in that. So I don't know what the worship team has planned to sing, but I think we should sing that song again on top of what you guys have planned. We're going to sing, magnify the Lord with me, and we'll go from there. But at any time, you talk to God and you respond to him. On the basis of this message, there's only so much I can do. I can answer questions, and I'd love to do that. I can pray with you. That's, that's fine. But there needs to come a moment where you yourself talk to God. And you say, God, I want to enter into that place. And I give you my heart for it to happen. God will do it. He will do it today and everything can change from this moment on. Would you bow your heads with me, please?